And here we are. Level 4 Examination 2012 Programming 2. Doesn't that sound exciting? Mm, well, please yourselves. Um, I've got a nice cup of tea and I can't drink it quietly apparently. Uh, anyway, um, I'm going to go through the exam questions um, which were in last year's paper. This year's paper would just make things too darn easy. So I'm going to go through all the bits that I've done, which are in this case <coughs> the first three questions on the paper. Uh, and a bit, I think I'll have to do a double check, but anyway, we'll hit that when we get there. Um, very important point, back up here a second, sorry. Um, answer all questions. If you've done one of these papers before, uh, <laughs> this is going to bring, bring back wonderful memories. But if you have, uh, or, you're, or you're looking at old papers, more importantly, and finding they had a pick one of, uh, pick uh, two of three in the final section in the previous uh, exams, then that's changed. Um, as of last year, uh, all the papers uh, from now on in the first year, you have to do all the questions, and this one's no exception. So if you're seeing papers in past papers where you've got to pick two from three, uh, that was fine then, but this is now, and now you have to do all the questions. All the questions are out of 30, um, and uh, as far as the way the exam marking works, you've got to get at least 40% uh, to pass. So if you do one and a bit questions, then uh, uh, and get those bits right, then you've kind of won. Uh, and in case you're wondering, I've just received an email. Lucky old me. So here you go. Um, same as, pardon me, same as the Christmas format, pretty much, um, in that we have a whole bunch of questions and we mark out of 90 in total, which we then round up to be a 100. So let's have a look. Question one, given the C-sharp statement below, which is part of an employee management application. So you've got, this is used quite a lot in the exams, you've basically got um, a little scenario um, which is uh, set up for you. So we're storing data about people who work for us uh, and the line of code says employee E equals new employee Fred blogs. It's this bit here. Um, what you have to do is basically try to figure out stuff based on that statement there. So let's have a look. Identify the type of the object which has just been created. Now there's obviously been something happening here because employee isn't part of C sharp. The person writing the system must have actually made a class with that, well, an, a type with that name. Um, so somewhere in the program, some uh, some code defines what an employee is. Uh, as far as we're concerned, we don't really know, but we do know that E is the variable that's been created, and it is of type employee. If I was writing C sharp and I said int i, you go, oh, uh, i is of type int. Um, if you see some C, some <laughs> if you see some C sharp, that's a tongue twister. Um, which has employee E like this, then you can be fairly sure that the first bit is the name of the type and the second thing is the variable name that has been picked to represent a particular um, instance or, or re reference to or value of this type. Uh, and so in this case, the correct answer to question A is it's an employee. We can't be sure what it is because we don't, we haven't seen the creation of it, but we do know that in C Sharp, if you write that, what that means is you've actually got yourself an employee. Um, so we can move on to question part B um, and explain why the programmer must have created a constructor for the employee type, at least one of them at any rate. This is four marks up for grabs and it's not too painful to do either. Um, and a constructor is the thing that runs when the object is called into existence. Um, constructors are called after the word new and then the type and then the constructor, this bit here. Um, in this case we're feeding the constructor Fred Bloggs um, with only one G. This is <laughs> this is a Spanish Bloggs who just have the one a G um, or something who nobody knows. Um, anywho, it looks to me like that string is the name of the uh, person who's been created and is being passed into the code that creates the employee when it actually is constructed. This code is called the constructor. And normally speaking, C Sharp will actually make one for you if you don't create one yourself. Um, you've seen this before way, way back. You managed to make new items, lots of other kinds of new things, and you don't actually have to tell the constructor anything because C Sharp will make a default 
empty one for you. And by empty, I mean a constructor which accepts nothing at all, doesn't have any parameters. Okay, this is interesting because it does accept parameters. It takes on in this string, uh, the Spanish for blogs, and that means that the programmer must have put behaviors in to deal with that. If you remember, you can create your own constructors that go in the uh, in the object and uh, they get control when the new instances are made and they actually set the values up in those instances. The programmer must have done that because the default constructor the compiler makes has no parameters. So a correct answer with four marks in this situation is that the programmer must have made a constructor because the default one, uh, the one that comes from the compiler if you don't give one to the class, um, accepts no parameters. So somewhere inside the employee type is a piece of code that takes a string um, and hopefully stores it in the name of that particular person. So correct answer there is that basically uh, we know the programmer must have made one because the default constructor, the one that is made automatically, does not accept any parameters. So in order to make that work, there must be a string being fed into a constructor somewhere which a programmer must have written. I hope you've got that because I'm going to move on to the next part anyway at this point. So question one part C. Let's just roll the magic down. The system needs to hold the address. Okay, we want to know where Frob, Fred, Frod, Fred Blogs lives. Presumably somewhere in Spain because he's, as we've established, the Spanish, <laughs> Spanish blogs. Um, so he could live in High Street, Madrid. Uh, say, that's a string. So uh, we're looking at holding the address, and the first part of the question is suggest a type to hold the address. Um, strings are good for this. Um, you could say several strings: uh, street name. Uh, uh, um, and then city name and then postcode or you could put those in one big string and separate them out with line feeds I don't really mind um, as far as we're concerned the correct answer is uh, put it in a string um, and so that's the first part be very careful in these questions that you read everything make sure you answer both halves just because you can answer the first bit and come up with a type that's great what I want you to do now though is explain how we can set that value when a new employee is created. Now we saw in the previous question that we fed one string in which had the name of the person. Seems obvious to me, uh, but then again I, I did write the question, that to actually um, set up a, an address as well you would make a different constructor which accepted two strings. Um, the first string being the name of the person and the second string being the place where they live. And so the correct answer here is that you want a, a data type to hold the address which a string will be really good for and uh, uh, in that situation we'd actually pass a second string in which is going to be the name, sorry, the address of where the, plo the bloke or bloke s or whatever lives. So that's how it works. Correct answer then is it's a string. Um, we're going to make another constructor or improve the existing constructor to accept another string. So you're going to basically say uh, employee e equals new employee Fred Bloggs, comma, High Street Madrid both as strings. So that's all fine and dandy and that's six more easy marks. Well on the way to passing here. Part D then Hove's interview. Um, oh employee is a class. Now as I was saying earlier in the week in the lecture um, employee could easily have been a structure let alone facts that nobody cares about. Structures can have constructors too. You can make new ones of them should you wish to do this. No reason why not. Um, but the question is telling us that employee is actually a class, which is fine, and that's probably the best way to do it. Um, it's managed by reference because that's what classes do. Um, it's important that you understand what value and reference mean, and that's what this question is all about. Explain what reference and value mean and describe the result of an assignment operation for each type. So we are looking for three things here, really. We're asking you to say, what do reference and value mean? And then give me an example of an assignment and what happens for a reference and another one for a value. Be very careful when you read these questions that you actually make absolutely sure that you answer every part of the entire question because if you don't do that then uh, you won't get the marks and that will be that. So um, quick to answer them, let's go for it. Um, reference, if I say reference to you you should instantly say the word tag straight back to me. So you've got this image of in the case of our code E, our reference being a tag which is tied to a particular object 
which is lurking somewhere within the C sharp program memory space. We don't know where, we just know it's there somewhere, which is nice. Okay, so in the case of uh, a, a reference, a reference means that we access things via the tag, and the tag is attached to a particular instance that lives in memory somewhere. Um, and so if I assign one reference to another, it has the effect of tying that particular tag to a particular object in memory. There's no limit to how many references can refer to a given object. If that number gets down to zero, in other words, no references refer to this poor thing, at that point it has no reason to exist because there's no way of getting there, a bit like a house with no road to it. And so, um, as far as we're concerned, assigning references, um, we have this tag which is attached to the object. If we assign the reference, we then have two tags attached to the same object, and that's how references work. Values, on the other hand, you can think of as a box that contains something, and when I assign a value to another value, we take the value in the first box, the, the source box, and copy it into the destination. So values are passed around as values. We just move the, we, we just copy the value from one thing to another. Um, but uh, references, we're fiddling with tags. Um, and so that's going to get you your six marks. Um, if you want to draw diagrams or put some sample code or discuss what happens uh, when things are happen by using specific examples from coursework, that's absolutely fine. Please do that. It makes it much easier for me to get my head around whether or not you understand what's going on. So examples and what have you are all fine and dandy and work quite well in this context. So don't be afraid to do that. And we can move on now to the rest of question one. The meaning of null. Explain what it means when a reference in a C-sharp program is set to the null value. Uh, null means, well, it's an explicit way of saying, I don't refer anywhere. Uh, there's nothing tied on the end of my tag. Uh, the tag is there, but there's nothing attached to it. Um, when you make a brand new reference, if you don't refer it to anything, if you just say employee E, as opposed to employee E equals new employee, then you get yourself a null reference. And if you've got one of those, basically it means if you try and use it to find the thing that's on the end of it, your program will fail with an exception which is caused in this specific circumstance. So we have this idea that we can explicitly, rep we can explicitly represent the fact that a reference doesn't go anywhere. Great. Why on earth? Would so effectively, that's the first part of the question. Uh, if a reference is set to null, we've effectively told the uh, the software, the software is, is now making note of the fact that the reference doesn't actually refer to an object in memory. Uh, okay, but when on earth would you use that? Well, several situations. Uh, the best one for me is if I ask a program to go off and find something, hey, get me a reference to the customer record for Fred Blogs with 1G, please then if the system looks through and can't find that, it has to have a way of saying, oh, sorry, can't find that one. Um, you probably may have spelt the name wrong or something. I don't know. Um, in that case, it could pass a null reference back. One of the things about null references that makes them interesting and useful in programs is I can test for them. I can say if customer ref equals equals null and the program will return a true if it's been set to refer nowhere. Okay, that means that before I use my reference that my search method has returned to me, I'll check to make sure that it's got an object on the end of it and not null, and then I'll behave appropriately. So null is a way in a program that you can explicitly represent the fact that you've asked me for something, but I can't give you it. Uh, you get the same behavior in, in some situations where you ask for an object which uses up a large amount of memory, and for whatever reason that memory is not available. In that situation, you might well get a null back, which indicates that the system has tried to get you the memory, uh, but it couldn't find enough, and so it's given you a null to indicate it's failed. So null is great for indicating a situation where a reference has no meaning and you can test for it, and in fact you should, because if you don't, <laughs> your program will throw an exception. And now I'm going to have some tea. Wonderful. Fantastic. Okay, so that's what those are for. Uh, that might be the end of question one. Question one tends to have lots of little bits in. Yep, that's the end of question one. That's good. Now we can move on to question two. Now, there will be a question a bit like this. It will not necessarily 
be about electrical components, but it will be about a collection of objects which are in some way related. Um, if you look in the past papers going back to a long, long way in the past, you'll find that we always do this and we always shall because I want you to at least have the experience once of actually creating some kind of design which uses different types of class. So the customer has given you a bunch of information about a particular problem area and you as a programmer have been brought in to actually make a solution which holds this data for them and uh, all the items are in some way related and you're going to make yourself a tree. Um, all items in stock and it doesn't matter that you know, you know nothing about resistors or capacitors or power because as far as you're concerned these are just properties um, of different types of data that you're going to have to store in your program. You don't need to worry too much about precisely what they are. So reading through all the items in the stock have a description, a price, a serial number and a stock value that gives how many of them we have. If you had a go at vinyl destination in the programming course then you're already kind of nicely sort of in another bad place. If you went to lectures about that then that's fine too um, because we're kind of doing the same kind of thing as a record shop does but a little bit different and what you'll probably find if you look at most systems that store data a bit like this is they're all a bit like the record shop. There's, there's basically a big sort of uh, um, collection of behaviors that lots of systems have and so let's go through this. Items have got description, price, serial number, uh, stock level. Resistors are stock items okay so they're a special kind of stock item which has a resistance value uh, which is a particular number of ohms. Fantastic. Power resistors are just like resistors but also have a power rating which is given as number of watts and capacitors uh, are stock items that have a capacitance which is a particular number of microfarads. This is all sensible stuff. As far as you're concerned you're finding points on a diagram, boxes on a diagram and deciding what to write in them. Uh, for the eight marks that you're going to get for the first part we're going to design a class diagram to show the hierarchy. Um, the hierarchy starts at the top with the most abstract thing, which is the thing uh, which you can regard everything in your system as. And then we go down and add detail and refine until we get to specifics. Okay, So the abstract thing in this case, I reckon, is stock item. And that sits right at the very top. And so you can effectively make that the parent class of everything else in your component store. Um, along in the line of the components. So you then look at what stock item has to have and the best way to answer this question is to draw a box, write stock item above it or just at the top and then inside put the name and type of all the things you, you think that stock item should hold. Um, if you want to draw the boxes and then write some text underneath that's fine too. Either way will get you full marks but the box and just a couple of words is probably the best way to do it. So description, that's a piece of text that's going to be a string. Price, well, there's a number of ways you could store price. Um, we've explored most of them, I think, in <laughs> any ones that don't work, a boolean um, and string, probably. Um, anything which is a number, you can defend here. You could say decimal because it's very precise. You could say integer because I'm storing pennies. You could say double because um, I like double. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to hold them very, 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 very accurately. Or you could say float um, because you like boats. I have no idea. Um, anything which is numeric, you can make a good case for. If it was me, I'd say the price is pennies, but that's just me. Um, you can, as long as you explain why you've made that choice, um, then that's the key thing. So the price is a number. Uh, serial number, though, is a bit of a red herring. Um, in my experience, and I look on the back of my, uh, my telly and my cameras and bits and pieces, this is quite often a string and so you might find that serial number ends up being a lump of text. You might have an A on the end uh, which is certainly not going to work at all in a number. So what you might like to say is that serial number is a string, that's fine. Um, and the stock level value, how many of these we have got in stock. Um, perhaps the best one for that is an integer because we're not going to have half of a component at any time. You could even go one better than that and say it's a si uh, an, an uh, unsigned integer which basically means it can't ever be negative because you're never going to have less than naught resistors in your little uh, uh, box. So anything which lets me count integers so in or whatever 
is absolutely fine for the number in stock. So we've got four things in there, a string for the description, uh, a number of some kind for the price, uh, a string for the serial number, and a stock level value, which is also um, an integer. Um, that's at the top. Everything underneath, all the children of this parent class will pick up those behaviors, so don't add them in again. Um, if I make my resistor a child of the stock item class, which I will do because it wants everything which the stock item has got plus some other stuff, then that means it gets the other stuff. So don't go putting description and things inside resistor as well. That will lose you marks. Okay, so resistor's got a resistance value, which is number of ohms. And again, you can tell me it's a double or a float or an integer, uh, and I'm perfectly happy with that. Uh, power resistors, well, we're dropping one level down the tree here again, aren't we? Because they're just like resistors, so they pick up all the behaviors from the parent and they extend the resistor class uh, and drop down and add this power rating, which is a number of watts. Uh, and again, these are both numbers, so in the box you'd write watts colon int or int colon watts. I don't really care which way around it is to say what's being stored in there. So you draw all this out, um, you get it all uh, how it should be, and you walk away with eight marks under your belt, which is a fifth of the marks you need to pass. So this is pretty good. Uh, not a bad place to be. Okay, so having drawn your hierarchy and feeling very pleased, you turn over the page and have a look at the next part of the question. Oh, okay. The customer's telling me some capacitors are electrolytic. Now, they, they, do you see, these actually do exist. You don't need to know what they are really or how they work or when they're used, but the thing about this kind of capacitor is that the customer is concerned that they have to be stored, they have to have a connection to the circuit in a particular way. Um, a normal capacitor, I can plug in and I can use it. Electrolytic has to be the right way round. Okay, so we have an extra piece of information about capacitor. Um, how do we store this? Well, um, you could suggest making a child of the capacitor class called electrolytic capacitor, which contains a, f uh, uh, which means that if it's one of those, it's got this extra property that that would work. You could explain that would make sense. You could add a property to the capacitor class which says are you electrolytic true or false um, in terms of which one is the best well they both get four marks so as far as you're concerned they're both the best I don't really care which you do as long as you explain why you've done it and that explanation makes sense so the bottom line in all of this stuff is explain your reasoning don't just drop stuff out with no context because if i've got no context it's much much harder for me to figure out whether to give you any marks or not for it so in this situation you could add a property to the capacitor which says are you or are you not one of these must connect right way round devices or you could add a second a uh, child class which is where all the electrolytics would live. It's entirely up to you. Either of those makes a kind of sense. I can make a good case for either and pardon me. Uh, so yeah, just go with that one. That's absolutely fine. Moving on to part C. Here we go. Rattling through question two at speed. We can make things abstract. Ooh, abstract. What does that mean? Well, it means we're never ever gonna make one of these. Okay, they're purely an abstraction. They're just um, everything in our system is stock, but we don't have a thing which is a stock item. We have resistors, we have capacitors, we have power resistors, we have anything else we might sell, but the stock item is an abstraction of this. Um, so the correct answer here is that the, the one at the top, the one at the very top, is the one you can make abstract and it's basically saying to programmers who are building things for my system hey we're never going to make one of these it's an abstraction it has a bunch of properties that everybody in the tree should have and um, we will probably manage our store of components by having a list of stock items but in fact what's in there will be all the various different child objects uh, like resistor capacitor blah blah um, so um, we make the class abstract, it's the absolute parent one, in this case stock item, and the effect of making it abstract is we can't ever make a stock item, which is fine because we don't ever need to, and uh, the effect is it therefore it's a template, 
it's actually um, not used uh, to store data it's used to represent the fact that we are storing things of this kind okay so that's going to get you four marks um, if you're not quite sure on that take some time to read through the stuff in the yellow book about bank accounts that's a good plan too um, I'm going to move on to part D while you do that if you need to so some things are private and some things are public um, as far as business stuff is concerned like shops then it's quite reasonable to want to protect the important data we do not want other programmers being able to fiddle with the price of items or the number we have in stock or that kind of stuff um, so we'll make that private and then we'll use a public method to provide access to that so in, in terms of how public and private tend to be used when you want to protect data then we'll make the data inside private and provide a public method that gets hold of it and then you will say ah yeah but doesn't that mean a naughty programmer could just call the public method and get the job done that way and then I say ah yes that's absolutely true and you could do that but the public method could write in a log file that the price has just been changed or it could raise an alarm or it could make sure the value is a sensible one or that you can't change the price more than once a day or blah 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 the point is we get control when someone tries to twiddle with the data and that's why you make things private because the public method well anyone can call it the method can decide whether or not it's okay to do this so um, we use private to protect the data and we use public to provide methods that anybody can use to fiddle with that data and that's how it works and it's all jolly good and um, in the case of business applications absolutely fine you should do this in case of games where it doesn't really matter if you move things around on the screen um, without sort of directly and you're more concerned with performance in the case of games you might make everything public and have done with it because it doesn't really matter no one's going to lose any money if that sprite gets moved two pixels to the left by a piece of code without being asked so that's all fine and dandy too okay delegates yup delegates um, it's a tricky one this because the English language doesn't really help um, a delegate um, you might think it's someone that goes to a conference uh, uh, in the case of C sharp it's best to think of somebody you've given a job to do uh, and a way you can tell a system that is the case so when the system comes along and says who's going to deal with this button press you can say ah it's that method over there um, because that's what's going to happen you're going to make a button the button will sit on the screen somewhere the user will click on the button and when the button gets clicked you're going to want a particular method of yours to deal with that okay now the button is just a, a lump of data that describes a piece of the screen and it just sits there and, and waits for events to come its way um, to tell the button what to do when it gets clicked you pass it a delegate and the delegates a lump of data which effectively describes a particular method in a particular class now the nice thing about this as far as you're concerned is that Visual Studio when you use that to make your Windows applications that have Windows on the front um, will do all this wiring up for you and it will make the delegates but I really want you to understand what is going on here because it's kind of like a useful technique to get your head round effectively we're going to have a method called handle button or print hello or save data or cancel or exit program and we're going to have a method which is going to want to be executed when that button is pressed the delegate is if is effectively the lump data which says it's that method there and so we hand that particular lump of data off to the button so when the button is pressed it goes oh yeah who do i call oh it's that one we could make a method called ghostbusters which you could then call <laughs> that's probably a very old cultural reference which I apologize um, but the idea is that the delegate is a mechanism by which I can say it's that method there please and I can make a delegate that describes that method there please and I can hand that off to somebody else to call when the event occurs and in the case of a windowed program that somebody else is quite often a button so a delegate is effectively um, if you're using a proper technical term it's a type safe reference to a method in a class um, if you unpick those words very carefully type safe means I can call 
the, a method which has got the right mix of parameters for the problem that I'm solving. Um, it, in a class, of course it is, because in C-sharp everything is. Um, and the delegate effectively describes that particular method. That's how it works. So five marks, put all that down, away you go. That's lovely. We must have passed by now. My goodness, we must. Question part three. Explain the function of the garbage. For some reason, as I mentioned on Tuesday, everyone knows how the garbage man works. Um, we talked about references a bit, bit back. We said that sometimes references are null. And we also said that some type, an object can have as many references to it as you like, including zero. If an object has zero references to it, it's like having a house that has no road to it, the object may as well not exist. In that situation, since the object can't be got to, we might as well throw it away. And the garbage collector is all the time searching through the list of active objects in the system. It maintains its own special list. And if it finds an object on its list that has no references to it anymore, it removes it. So the garbage man is continuously chugging through looking for things to delete. Um, so part one of the question, the garbage man is there to get rid of objects that no longer have references to them. Fine. Second one, when does it do stuff? Well, it'll operate when it finds an object that has no references. Um, you could also make the point that, generally speaking, the garbage collector will tick along picking up um, things in parallel with your program. It tends to run alongside your, your program on a separate thread. And um, it will also get called in if bad things start to happen. If the program runs low on memory, uh, then it will trigger a garbage collection to try and free off some memory which you can then make available for other parts of the program to use. So garbage man gets rid of objects that have no references to them and it'll operate when it, when it finds one of those. It's running most of the time continuously and also they can kick in when the amount of memory in the program is a bit low. Those are the two things and that's another five marks and I think that's the end of question two. Question three. Hang on, have I, have I skipped one? Am I going too fast here? Oh, kidoki. Right. Question three, part A. I do the first 15 marks of question three and then Dr. Brayshaw takes over. Um, I can't do podcasts for his bit because I don't feel qualified. <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? Um, so, interfaces. Right. Anyone that says an interface has got buttons and and text boxes um, will not get seven marks, uh, particularly if they use that voice and they say it during the exam. Uh, don't do that. Um, in this case, the interface we're talking about is the one, um, there's a bit of a yin and yang here. Interfaces and abstract classes are kind of uh, sort of related in a similar kind of way. An interface is a list of things that I say I can do. Um, an interface uh, is something which a class says it can do. So the class might say, um, I can print myself, or I can store myself in a file, or I can um, tell, I can, uh, I don't know, there's all kinds of things it might want to do. The thing about interfaces is it's basically a list of methods which the class claims it can do, which is fine. Uh, that's okay. Think of it as a curriculum vitae for classes, if you wish. Uh, and you're all thinking, oh, okay, that's fine. So I can, I can claim I can do stuff and provide methods to do that. What's the point? Well, the point is that quite often in programming, you want to treat something as a component that just has a particular ability and you don't care what the component actually is. Um, the best example for this and the one I would expect you to write down and get your seven marks is printing. My employee database will have employees, custom, well, my, well, my, It'll have employees, it'll have addresses, it'll have, I don't know, uh, all kinds of other bits and pieces, uh, none of which I can think of at the moment. Job descriptions, all kinds of stuff in my employee thing. Uh, letters, um, contracts, all kind of good stuff. All these are going to be classes in my system because that's how I make the systems work. But... Um, they're all going to be in different hierarchies. So I'll have a hierarchy of letters in one corner. I'll have a hierarchy of employees, paid by the month, salaried employees, weekly ones, uh, contractors. I'll have a hierarchy of uh, uh, contracts and blah. All totally different. All needed to be printed. Okay. Now, the printer 
she's going to be given things to print, doesn't want to care that it's a contract or a person or uh, uh, whatever, doesn't want to care at all, just wants to treat this thing as, hey, you're something that can be printed. I can ask you to print yourself on this piece of paper, so please do that. Um, the printer doesn't want to care what it is, it just wants to use it as a object with a particular ability, as a component that can do a particular thing. And that's where interfaces really come into their own. Because what happens is effectively the components can say, hey, I can print. Um, they can be managed in terms of a reference to that particular type of interface, which you could call iPrintable if you wanted to. And that could contain methods like do print, or whatever you want to call them. And uh, that's actually in the notes for this. So take a look at the slides if you want even more chapter and verse on this. Um, and the idea is that um, the printer doesn't have to know it's a contract or an employee or what it is, it will just say, hey, print yourself. And so I can print out any object in the system um, in a way that makes sense to it without having to care what that object really is. So if I implement an interface, it means I have a bunch of methods that means I can behave like a particular kind of component. Um, and uh, <laughs> maybe you could think about it this way. Um, if my if I have a, if I bring a device into the house that has an HDMI socket on the side of it, that means I can plug it into a telly. That device might be a DVD player, a computer, a console, um, a camera, could be anything. The TV doesn't care. The TV is just getting its video signals the way it likes to see them, um, and the interface is the HDMI connection, which is effectively defining what goes down this wire to make a pretty picture appear on the screen. Um, so that's the same with my printer. My printer is just taking stuff that can print. It doesn't know what it is, but it knows it has a socket on the side with these methods in, which I can effectively use to make things happen. And so if you're looking at uh, examples of how that works and why it works the way it does, that's a good way to do it. So all that lines up very nicely. Um, and so put that in your answer. Don't feel you have to squeeze it all into these lines either because you can write further down the page if you like. Um, the amount of space you get on the answer sheet is really there to uh, act as a guideline so you don't write too much. But if you need to write more, just go over the edge. I don't mind and I won't tell anybody. It'll be our secret. Okay. Why am I whispering? I have no idea. Final part. My final part. Try catch. Right, okay, this shouldn't take too long because everyone knows about try catch because everyone's used pars. Pars, day one, week one, whenever it was, try and read a number, user types in hello mum, program explodes in a shower of sparks because the pars method says hello mum, me no likey, can't make it into a number and promptly blows up. Now you know, because you've had to do this, that the way to deal with that is to put a try around the pars bit and a catch at the end that prints out please do not type hello mum, please type me a number what I can parse. Okay, so an exception is something which is thrown by a piece of code that is going to do something which could fail in a catastrophic way, parse being a case in point, reading from files being another one, uh, and creating files a third, and the catch bit is the way in which you make your program fail gracefully. Um, and so try we put the dodgy stuff, catch, we deal with what might happen if things go badly. And finally, finally is the tricky bit, the bit that gets you the last two marks of your eight. Finally means whatever happens, if exceptions get thrown, if the whole thing blows up, if we return from the method, if all kinds of bad things happen, finally will always run. It'll always turn up with a hanky and mop your eyes. Uh, and wipe those tears away. Uh, finally is the place where you close any resources which you are using in the try bit and you can be absolutely sure that whatever happens in the try and the catch the finally code will always run. Quite often in the catch bit the programmer might think oh this method's a waste of time I will return I'll go back from whatever called me. That's perfectly okay but you probably want some tidying up to happen before it actually does that that's where you put the tidying up method inside the finally clause. So the idea is to try catch, try dodgy stuff, catch, fail gracefully, finally close everything down and tidy up. 
In terms of giving an example of a situation, there are lots. Pars is a great one. Um, and you could also make the point for ultra uber mega m marks. I guess that there's no reason why the finally behavior couldn't be to well the, sorry, the catch behavior couldn't be to rethrow the exception. So you could do your bit because I kind of like throwing exceptions. It means that the person who's using my program badly and getting me into a na nasty state is going to get their comeuppance in the form of a, <laughs> a really hard, <laughs> really hard kick. Um, in a painful region, hopefully, um, because it means that they can't get away with ignoring errors that I think are rather important. So um, anything parsing, opening files, that kind of stuff is when we use it. And finally, like I said, if we open a file and try and read it and it goes wrong, finally is where the code will live that will close that because the finally will run whether it works or not. And that's me. 40 minutes and 36 seconds of deathless prose, all on one breath. My tea's gone cold now. I've hardly drunk any of it. Ah, oh, well, there you go. Best of luck in the exams. If you want to bring an exam along and have me go through it um, and keep a straight face all the way, that's fine. Answer the questions, bring it along, and I'll mark it for you before your very eyes. Uh, good luck on Wednesday, folks, and uh, no doubt I will see you uh, next year.